we're really fortunate that not only are we able to celebrate for the publication of our new books, but also to have this fantastic show by the two artists here as well. Uh, and uh, John McKegg uh, does woodcut prints, has actually been with us before. Uh, it was 10 years ago that John came and did a pro program with my interns and students from Western Michigan University. And we actually printed that book, that print, that's the farthest one over there, here at the Book Art Center 10 years ago. And we've been storing it here since then. And now we have the opportunity to include it also in the show. Uh, Carol Allen is a friend of mine from many years back. And uh, the other really nice thing was that Carol has been here for the past week. And she's been working in our studios, uh, making monoprints, which are individual prints. Uh, for another book that we're planning to start on this summer by a poet, poet his name is Robin Gadient, and we have a whole bunch of prints to make hers. In fact, she's going to go back to uh, California and produce some more prints so that we can make a lot of copies of that book as well. So before we start with the poetry reading, I actually wanted to invite the artists to come up and talk a little bit about their work and about the experience that they've had here at the Book Art Center and with this project that we've been working on. So I think I'll start with Carolyn. Would you come up and talk a little bit about what they were doing? <laughs> and so it's an honored to be part of this project, and it's made me very happy. But at first, it made me very nervous. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, Jeff was saying, you know, could you look how close? It's like, look at what we're doing. Anything like that, but I'll try. I made this picture one day, it took me all day. I sent it to Chia, and it's you know, all these African American people or Afro Caribbean people hanging out in some Caribbean living room with their nice clothes on, like what she'd written about. And she wrote back and said, None of my family's that dark. <laughs> Photographs, she just mad me photographs. <laughs> An email from the saying that. <laughs> she wrote me the best email back. So I just thought this will give you just a little introduction to the way she thinks, which I love. So uh, I'm going to read it to you in case you have any worries about your own work. Anyway, you have, to, you have to believe in your own joy, like a plant growing up through asphalt, because that's what we are. And eventually the asphalt breaks up from the plants, small as they are, if there are enough of them. Let's you and I be two weeds, and we can feed the last goddamn bee. Which leads me to, Ari, the project. <laughs> I think our College of Creative Study tradition is to see this story as life and autobiography, a straight narrative which is what it looks like, but in my mind, it is a lyrical poem. It is an invocation of the imagination. It is raising those ghosts. Reading it makes the ghosts come alive. It isn't about me or my relatives or any of the circumstantialities. It is about existing in a certain space of imagination that is outside of and alongside of and inside of the social or documentary. It's a lot more like those paintings you do that aren't naturalistic landscapes, but feature characters from your inner life, like the naked lady with the big head that you sent me as a card with a mask in it. Any images out of my life are just a jumping off point. I would suggest that the art part of this is a chance to represent imagining. And so you can lean, for example, into simple iconic images that act like symbols or things that can be semi-abstract in some way. Because I think pretty much everything I've been writing for the past 20 years and have half-completed drafts of stuffed into accordion folders and a storage ottoman full of notebooks, et cetera, is about the rights of the imagination and the discovery of all the interesting ways it kind of origamis a person's story into different foldy beasts and presents their life back at them and as life, but not as life, but as art and gives back the mystery for which I am hugely grateful right now. That's cute. So. <laughs> 
I'm going to go over there and read some things that just happened because she gave me the freedom to imagine things. So I'm sorry about the camera and the microphone, but you can hear me. You can't see me here. Okay, similarly, John, who's like, hey, they talk about your work. Um, hi, everybody. Hi. Hey, Don. It's like, hi, I'm Mickey. No. <laughs> um, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, uh, Katie and Carol. It's been, we've only been around like each other for a day, but we're just like well, this. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you, my friends who would feel to came from very close by, long time friends. Um, so when I got, when Jeff asked me to do this, and he said, yeah, Charles going to send you a poetry. And I'm like, who is this guy? I don't know. And then, but he said, you'll see. And, you know, it's interesting what this idea of collaboration, I always think of as being with somebody who you know really well. But, of course, I didn't. I don't. I just met Todd tonight. And what is interesting to me when somebody who's um, really making something sincere and deep that you get to know them right away in their work. And there's a great quote of uh, Clint, Gustav Clint, our Austrian artist, even said uh, he didn't have any, didn't do any self portraits or any, have any photographs except one, I think, taken of him. He said, You want to know who I am? You come to my studio and see my fantastic one. And so it was very interesting to me that, um, Todd, when I read your poem, it's like it, it, it was just a really nice sense of being sincere and being uh, taught, it kind of interesting in ways of, that I relate to about using personal symbolism and how they, the context of them guess have a deeper meaning to them where they don't seem to fit um, in a normal day-to-day -day sense, but they fit, you know? And so I was just really interested in that. And that's what I was thinking about when I did the images, sort of uh, how the stacked sort of uh, context for things that don't necessarily fit together becomes new personal symbolism or series of personal symbols. And I was also thinking about kind of how they function almost as totems, these important kind of hierarchical things, but but then the hierarchy gets compressed into one image so that nothing is more important than anything else. So some little things become meaningful and some big things get maybe even pushed down a little bit, you think. So I just, um, that's what I was thinking about when I did them. And, uh, I, you know, I, just, I, I think maybe only the first, maybe the second time I've done a book like that. I've done some illustration work, but it was more kind of commercially oriented, not something when it's art coming at me and I have to react to it in a visual way. And um, there's a really kind of a funny quote, trying to do art about writing, trying to do visual art about writing is like trying to do cuisine about architecture. <laughs> I guess it's possible, but maybe, I don't know, maybe it's done that already. But um, so I, I was kind of, uh, humbled by the opportunity and um, wasn't sure if it worked, but I think um, I try to take it seriously, of course, and um, yeah, I guess I will. Um, anybody want to ask a question about it? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be hanging out and you can ask a question later if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, we're going to start the reading tonight with uh, Debbie Todd Kuneko. Uh, Todd is a professor at Grand Valley State University, and he's also a Kundeman Fellow. Um, his most recent book, which is called uh, This is How the Bones Sing, is about a place called Minidoka, which was a concentration camp for Japanese Americans during World War II. Uh, He's also been the author, his, his previous book was called The Dead Wrestler Elegies, and he's the co-editor of a writer's guide and anthology. Uh, his work has appeared in Poetry and Blackbird and Best Small Fiction. And he also, this will be the second time that Todd has read with us. Uh, he was with us in uh, 2021 as part of our Poets and Print series. We do a regular series where we print broadsides uh, by poets and they come and present their work for us. And, and so we're very pleased to have Todd back again to this reading and to be able to do an entire book with him this time. So please welcome uh, Kinecto. Thank 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with um, a poem by my father. Um, this is a poem that my father wrote about his father's death. Um, he wrote it back in 1983. Uh, it's called The Secrets in memory of Sandy Kaneko. I heard him fall. He's lying on the floor, and the mother's voice repeats the words that carried across the continents. Cold when I touched him. He's gone. The ambulance, my father's dead. It's been a year. I spit the words out, the secrets out. The garden's gone seedy. Even the compost knows. The star magnolia, and wisteria too. They miss him like a sharp wind or a thunder shower. The secret's out. I wanted him to die when he was ready, so I could take his place. But it's too late. The spider webs the corners of his room. My mother lives with my father's death. He's still preserved in his wedding solemnity on her buffet or laughing after 40 years about to catch the ball my mother's tossed. Every night she feeds his photograph, too busy with habit to understand that feeding a man is not her only freedom. The truth is, she won't let him die. She stuffed him into a cardboard box and packed him there. My heart staggers as his blood, like a drunk spider on a loose thread against my ribs. And I ignore it until she decides I should fill his place behind the wheel of his car or at the table behind Sunday's sports page, my elbows propped like his. I feel my heart wheeze, know that I'm dying inside, but I can't let him die either. I hold him here in my hands, this skin, nails, no eyes to cry. Muscles <clears throat> that work these words. If the ambulance was there on time, my mother remembers. Our words work a web around us. And how is our grief? Father, this is no good night. Goodbye. Goodbye. I want to read that poem just because it brings me into the room here um, with us to sort of celebrate this book that um, John made with me. Really, you know, thank you, John, for that work. There's, I can't imagine artwork to accompany those poems like the art that you made. There's such that rich starkness to, to those, those drawings. They're so mysterious and yet so clear. Uh, they're really, really lovely. Um, but I want to say thanks to Jeff for having me to, to make this book. Uh, and for Kate, for all the hard work of making it, putting it together. Or if you're the only man only too, like, I don't know, this is, oh, this is complex. I don't know if this is going to work. I crossed my finger, but it, it's, it's really important. Thank you for all your work on that. Um, thank you to Kia and Carolyn. Um, congratulations on your book. I'm looking forward to your reading tonight. Um, thank you all for being here because it's a, what? It's a, it's a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> my dad died in uh, 2017, March 30th. It feels like, man, it's hard to believe it's you know over six years ago. Um, I remember he died on March 30th. I got the call that morning, got on a plane on the morning of the 31st, arrived, um, said goodbye to him, um, and then went out to the island where he lived. And it was the first time I'd been to the islands. Um, first time I've been to that island without him. Um, and then April 1st, right? The beginning of National Poetry Month. And I, I wrote 30 poems in 30 days, two days after my dad died. And those poems say it was 30 poems about my dad. Um, and so I'm going to read like a poem that I, read, I wrote during those 30 days. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit about afterlife. Um, this is Elegy for Bruce Lee. Somewhere in the dark is a beautiful fight. One, two, cha cha cha. All our knuckles wrapping against the star's edges for the dancing master. 
for a flying sidekick to our body centers. My father called you little dragon Lee, told me how you how you swiveled your, your hips on dance floor. Three, four, cha cha cha. Then you both wrote love poems for a girl in your English class. I practiced throwing roundhouse kicks as a boy, feet aimed at my reflection in store windows, at street signs, at parked cars, at everything I knew I could break. Now my feet cannot leave the ground, and I write love poems for the dead. The last time I watched Enter the Dragon, I imagined it was my father emerging victorious from the Hall of Mirrors, my father hustling on the dance floor, because the last time I saw my father, he'd be waiting for me the whole day in the morgue. Hold me, he said. And I did, until his body stopped acting like it was alive. There is no fight, and there is no spark. No wretched cock crow in the dark, just this cha-cha-cha. Grief is a fist, and a promise to hurt someone. Just give it an inch, but you knuckle in the rest of them. It'll punch through everyone. Um, yes, sorry, this will be heavy. Mm -hmm. So after life, this um, the thing that struck me after my dad died, and I went back to his house, and I wrote like five poems in his study. Uh, and that was weird. Um, the weird thing was like I'd never been on this island. Is he lived on Bastion Island um, in the Pacific Northwest, just outside of Seattle? Um, but I, I've never, I've never been on the island without him. I've never been in his house without him. And so it was weird going there, uh, being in this place that was somewhat, it was a very different place after, you know, uh, after he died uh, and, and being there without him. And so this book, I think this is, it's a long poem um, that tries to reimagine what that island must be without him. Um, and it's, it's a weird poem because it's, it's, I think of it as modular. So it's a long poem, it's all these little short pieces because I have three kids. Uh, two, of, two of which are um, two years old twins. Yeah. And um, the thing about having twins is that everything you write is like, you know, these little short bursts because it's what, what can you do on your phone, right? Uh, what can you do in a couple of minutes you have between tantrums? Um, so that's how like, this poem was kind of conceived. Like, I, I wanted to write this long poem, but I, just, I can't focus. So there are these little little small pieces. I'm going to read um, a few of those, a few of these pieces um, today. So, um, I won't read the whole poem because that would be a slog. Um, this is afterlife. Descent. There is no such thing as death. Only midnight, the way birds fall silent before snowfall. The way the animals lay their heads beneath the moon each night and each day. Remember, a morning breaks life, the way a man vanishes into memory, the way, the only way. The dark. If you squeeze your eyes tight, you can almost see it, thick like flies swarming against winter lights. If you squeeze your lips closed, no one can hear what you say. The dead can see you, know what you're thinking. Your father has so much to tell you, you're ready to listen. Cartography. Another way to say island is place that is separated by, from you by water. Another way to say ocean is song where there was once old wind. Another way to say I'm sorry is I am on my way. Oh, I'm on my way. Arrival. It is still night when you arrive. The island darker than you remember it. The old trees are dying, crying children still comforted with soft words and promise of something sweet. Chocolate coin. A bird song wrapped in tinfoil, a piece of sunshine to chew in memory of how dark it was last night. Ghosts lingering where trees touch sky. And is it night where you are now? Are there trees where you are now? 
What are they saying? Hunting. And the island is different now that you have gone. Your father, correctly disintegrated into whatever adventure awaits on the other side of the gravestone. The forest animals lurk in woods, their voices uttering sounds that are really new ways to say your name, new words to welcome you home. Amen, they say, now that you are alone. Amen, they say, and bow their heads low so that no one can hear them. It's weird, some of these poems are like prose poems, and some of these poems are linear. Some of these poems are really just two poems. So it's, I don't know what to do with this, I just mash them together. Um, and, uh, I tell my students that sometimes that's, there's this lazy way you can write. You don't have to do it, just think of an easy, lazy way, uh, because you just need to get it done. Um, astronomy. And overhead, you can see another word for stars is ghosts and light long since extinguished. Galaxies spin about. Another word for ghost is wish dripping dark with sorrow, you like a shiver. Another word for sky is every time your father said he loved you, with sharks around your planet. Astronomy. And overhead, you can see galaxies spinning about you like a shiver of sharks around your planets. Another word for stars is ghosts of light long since extinguished. Another word for ghosts is wish dripping dark with sorrow. Another word for sky is every time your father said he loved you. Mm -hmm. Kind of skipping around here. Jeff gave me the, he said, I put um, a copy of the book up on the podium so you can read from it if you want. I was like, my eyes are bad. My, eye, my glasses only go so far down in the nose. So I can, I can like zip around my iPad and make the worst we get. Beacon. At this moment, it is night in at least two places on Earth. At your house, the fruit spoils and the dishes collect by the sink like laundry sets sit wet for days in the machine because living is a messy endeavor for the dead. At your father's house, there's a light in the window that illuminates the steep hill so that you might move through the trees and toward the beach where the fish are waiting to leap into your arms. No one is ever really gone till everyone is gone. Theosophy. Oh, right. I should do this. Sorry, I'm glad I just thought of something going off script. I'll do this. Theosophy. Your father tells you a story about the time you went to the beach to dig for clams. He laughs and explains how you refused to put your bare feet in the sand. He could not coerce you off the rock where you sat watching the seabirds circle overhead because you were afraid to get dirty. The beach, the clams, the seabirds, and the rock, all these things are irrelevant to this story. And my dad, actually, I just thought of this. I didn't plan to do this. Sorry, don't you hate it when people like, don't plan stuff and they kind of look the stuff in their book? Is it this one? I forget. I'm going to have to abandon this plan if I don't find it right away because I don't want you to make the later talk. Or I can yeah. use it later. <laughs> My dad was home about this very thing. I can't find a book yet. Sorry, maybe it's not a um, but it is actually a, a poem. He wrote a poem that adds actually that story about, yeah, my, my parents just, just like to tell me the story about how I didn't want to get dirty. 
Um, and now my sons are all playing in the mud. I'm like, where did you get that from? Get off of me and say, I'm not going to your own idea. Parapsychology. The moon is never just the moon. Another word for moon is radiant ghost planets. It is where the dead grieve for having left the earth. Another word for dead is ones who have forgotten their names. They dress in padded robes and heavy chains and cannot find their way back to their loved ones. Another word for robes is memories of home. Another word for chains is ancestral wisdom. And the earth is never just the earth. It's also the moon. Yeah. I'm going to read um, just a couple more pieces. Um, black noise. The animals can talk with the moon because they don't need a response to their cataloging in the night. You can't talk with the moon because you strain to hear the voices of the dead and hear the moon saying nothing. Outside right now, you can hear an animal laughing. Where it's a man crying. What the difference? Patrimony. At night, there's a lake leading into fog, an island hidden out there in the gloom. The road leads from the ferry dock to dense woods in a sparsely lit town where the wind sings a hollow tide song about joy and ravenous blackbirds. Deep in the woods, there's a house. It's easy to miss because there are no skeletons to point the way. The fireplace is always roaring in that house. Tiny angels devouring winter timber with their bright chants. There's a knife scarred table where one day your father and someone else's father will share a bottle of wine. They will talk about you. And later, when you arrive, they will refuse to reveal what they're saying. <laughs> um, yeah, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jeff, for making this book happen. Thank you, John, for your, your starting um, I'm looking forward to Kia's reading night too. Um, that first poem I read you the secret. Um, I wrote a poem in response to that one. This is called Asleep, written after that poem. Father, this is no, this is no good night. Goodbye. Goodbye. No, I don't want to have this conversation. So I turn the lights back on and say to the ceiling fan, hello. Hello. To the air that wafts about the room in summer, spirits without substance save that wispy heaviness that announces readiness to sleep. Hello to the bedroom window, open and full of night sounds. There's rain on the gutters, and an ambulance siren intermittent several blocks over. Above the house, the sky keeps us safe from being jettisoned in the space where the stars wink out one by one, like I am overtaken every day. I will never see you again. Father, this is no goodbye, because when I close my eyes, I see you waiting on the other side of the river. And some evenings, I would give anything to stay awake. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. That was great. So I, I almost feel like I don't need to introduce Kia Pencil because Caroline did such a good job of introducing her already. Um, he is also someone that I've known for a long time. Uh, we've traveled to Italy together. Uh, Kia is a, uh, was for a long time, or for a while, a, a teacher in the university. She has a a degree from uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and also a, a degree in journalism from Columbia University. She left academia uh, to work as a technical writer and editor, um, but also so that she could have the freedom to work on her own work. She, she's a writer and also an artist. Um, the, currently, she's working on a collection of stories and essays that uh, deal with topics including Greek myths, English novels and poetry, the novelist Jean Reese, African-American gospel music, Calypso, and her own 
personal experiences and history in the Caribbean. And the stories that are in this book, the ghosts, are from that collection. So I please welcome Kim and so. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Carolyn, and thank you all for being here. It's a treat and an honor and um, just wonderful. And thank you, Todd. Those poems were superb. And so I'm just going to start. I'm going to read it on one of these. Um, if you have any questions afterwards, you can, you can ask me. So I'm reading um, a story, it's called The Pirate Rackham. One June afternoon, I filed my doctoral dissertation at the University of California. And the next morning before daybreak, but you want me to move it further away. It's better? Yes. Okay. The next morning before daybreak, I was on a flight to Jamaica. At the end of that week, my father drove me from Mandeville, where he lived and worked, back to Kingston. We spent the night at Valley View, the house we lived in, in Jamaica, and where my father's brother Desmond lived, with his girlfriend Vicky and her daughter Sally. Also staying at the house were Norman, an old school friend of Uncle Desmond, and Norman's son Archie. I never did meet Norman. He was away at a church retreat. Archie, who had my brother's old room, was at that age of peak teenage annoyingness, when grown men aren't willing to admit him to their company, and he has to spend a lot of time losing arguments with the women in the house, <laughs> including the housekeeper. In the morning, my father found that he was, as usual, incapable of excluding anyone from the fun. He told Archie to come along. Uncle Desmond did not join us. His Achilles tendon had never recovered from the time when he snapped it, kicking a man about two years earlier, and he wasn't out for bouncing around in a sailboat. We left the house at about 8.30 and headed down the hill. It had been 13 years since I had been in Jamaica, 14 since I had been there with my father and had last done this drive from Valley View out to the Yacht Club. But I knew when he turned into a subdivision near Barbican, Barbican that we were making a detour. We're picking up the young lady from the bank, he said. It was the first time I was hearing of this. She's a very nice person, he said. He explained. The young lady from the bank lived with her parents, and when she answered the door, they were sitting in the living room reading the Sunday paper. They looked up inquiringly, and it must be said, not happy, to see a 50-something-year-old man standing there. The young lady from the bank was probably a year or two younger than I was, slight of build and a head shorter than I was. She was neat and quiet and very well brought up. And how many transactions across the bank counter it had taken to get to this level of rapport was a mystery I just didn't want to think about. <laughs> I could hear the chat without even thinking about it, see the big smile beaming at her. This is my big daughter, my father said to the young lady from the bank. <laughs> I'm Kia, I said. Her name was Cheryl. But even though I knew her name, I kept thinking of her as the young lady from the bank. <laughs> from Cheryl's house, we went to Deborah's house to rendezvous because from here it was a two-car outing. Deborah was an old girlfriend, he had explained, but that was too much, but she was too much into that religion business. A lovely person, though, you like her. Along with Deborah came her daughter Tina, about 13 who bossed my father around by the champ. <laughs> then the two cars drove over to Deborah's friend Andrea's house. At one time, Andrea and Uncle Derek had considered dating, but it hadn't worked out. <laughs> they had all remained friends, and Andrea was a lovely person. <laughs> so by the time we left Andrea's house and had no more stops to make before the yacht club, I was already in a foul mood, silent and sullen, while my father tried to bring the young lady from the bank out of her shyness with cheerful, bantering nonsense. Do you know how to swim, Cheryl? No, she replied. Well, don't worry. We won't let you fall out of the boat. You have absolutely nothing to worry about. No one is allowed to fall out of my boat. Why did he have to make everything so complicated? Why did he bring this poor woman along with him? Why can't he be serious? 
Why did he have to have everything turn into a circus? I was raging inwardly. It was late. How are we going to do this now? Was it going to be one of these outings where we unloading the boat in the dark, tired and cranky? Why did things have to be so out of control? Why couldn't anything be simple? But there was the roundabout, and we turned out to Palisade Road, Palisados Road, one of the first place names I ever knew. And on the windward side of the narrow flat peninsula was the beach where I had the first memory of ever being on a beach at all. On the sloping sand, well back from the breaking waves, my father, me, my brother, and a girlfriend. Which one? I don't remember any of them. I couldn't have been more than three. Because when I was four, my mother came back. My father's sailboat, the third he had ever owned, was just under 42 feet long. He had had it built in France and sailed it across the Atlantic with two completely inexperienced sailors. And he had sailed into Cayman with my brother in what he thought was an unusually favorable tailwind that turned out to be the front edge of the most destructive hurricane to hit the Western Caribbean in 30 years. He had sailed it single-handed to Cayman another time, and three days out with no sleep, found himself in conversation with the ghost of the man who had taught him to sail. <laughs> he had managed to hold on to this boat even when he couldn't afford to own a car. I was seeing it for the first time, and this is how I found out he had named it after me. I saw my name, not hand-lettered in paint, but stuck on in the sort of stick-on letters used as the street number for a mailbox on the contractor's <laughs> or a contractor's toolbox. <laughs> what is this, I asked him. I thought you might like it, he said. <laughs> what do you think? I had to smile, I couldn't help it. He had named his boat after me and evidently had forgot to ever mention the fact mm -hmm. for five evil years. Mm -hmm. And that he could forget a thing like that filled me with delight. <laughs> I had long years before learned to dread announcements. This was perfect. <laughs> It was the complete innocence of any expectation of emotional capital out of anything that just utterly disarmed me. For all I knew, he might simply not have been able to decide among several other choices. He was terrible at making decisions, as I was, and had at last just settled down the nearest hand just so we could get the boat out of the shipyard. <laughs> Deborah arrived with Andrea and Tina, and now that the party was all complete, he was in high spirits. We got all the food, food and drinks stowed away quickly, while he prepared to cast off, and in a surprisingly short time, we were pulling away from the marina. Now see, he said to me, with this one, we can use the shadow channel, which saves a lot of time. Deborah and Andrea were both single women in their 40s, smart and very much in charge of their own program. Deborah ran a commercial landscaping business. Andrea was a sculptor. The two of them, I mean, Tina, had a sort of proprietary and protective attitude to my father, they quickly endeared all of them to me, as did their red humor and big laughter, which soon put even the young lady from the bank at ease. They had been good to him when he arrived on the boat, banged up and broke after his divorce to the country he hadn't lived in for 10 years. Listening to him and the women chatting away merrily, I realized this was what it was like when he was happy. The energy of his high spirits was like a fountain from which all could drink. Even Archie began to relax under its influence. You could see the tension leave him when he realized no one expected him to do anything. No one was going to snap at him. After a while, he took off his shirt. After another while, he took off his undershirt. The young lady from the bank gave up trying to keep her hair from blowing about. I allowed myself to be happy too. We spent the afternoon out at Lime Key, picnicking and swimming. My father managed to do a little of the tinkering there always was to do on the boat. When we weighed anchor and set the sails and were out of the lee of the island, the southeast wind was still blowing, but it was behind us. And after a few minutes, under the influence of that gentle movement, a couple of beers, and the day's activities and excitement, I suppose, I felt a thick and soupy grogginess come over me. I went below and cleared some of the clutter of tools, manuals, and things that my father didn't know where else to store from one of the upper bunks and climbed into it. To the sound of voices talking, the gurgle of water just a few inches from my head, and the creak of the rigging, I fell into a deep sleep. I woke up when I felt and heard the boat come about and knew that we must be passing Rackham's, the red shipping channel marker, 
that was nearest of all markers to the shoreline of Port Royal. The channel was at its narrowest, a passage between two small keys. Rackham's was the one with some vegetation on it. From here, you could see the broad expanse of gray sands on the windward side of Port Royal. The town itself screened from view by a dense growth of acacia and the other scrubby, prickly, prickly vegetation that you find on a Caribbean windward shore. I could see it all with my eyes closed. What I did not expect to see with my eyes closed was a red-faced pirate hanging in chains from the top of the channel marker, dead, but grinning in horrible defiance under a bright, cloudless sky that was nothing like the sky we had just been sailing under. My father had told my brother and me that the king and its towering red marker got their names from Raka, a particularly terrible pirate who had been hanged there in chains as an example to others. And then I remember too, how in all those years of sailing to Lion Key, after a day of snorkeling and spearfishing or rowing, I would take a nap in the cabin and be awakened by the boat coming about to get through that narrow passage. And I would think of the pirate there hanging, grinning, furious to get down and be terrible some more. The channel marker where I had always pictured Rackham hanging had obviously not even been built until more than a hundred years after he was supposedly hanged there. But even now, when I try to get him to come down and hang on the beach, he just keeps going right back up on top of the channel marker again. There he must stay, I suppose. When I rolled downhill into the cabin wall, I went back up on deck. We had rounded the point and the wind was coming across the beam. It was a sweet little bit of sailing the rest of the way, fast and steady. Archie was lying at full length along the port side of the deck, holding on with both hands to a stanchion. This is fantastic, he said, and he woke with sheer physical delight. Two bottlenose dolphins surfaced, one on either side of the bow, and raced alongside of us for several minutes until we reached the calmer waters just outside the yacht club basin. I think they were drawn by Archie's voice. It was not the first time I had seen dolphins come to where they heard low voices of children at bay. How old were we when my father told us the story of the pirate Rackham? It could have been the first time we ever sailed or boated past that marker. It could have been one of those Sunday mornings when he and our mother and two of us children and the dog Salto went looking for sea graves and lore among the old garrison cemeteries where most of the dead soldiers were felled not by earthquake or war, but by the yellow fever that bred in the mangroves. We knew this from reading the epitaphs. A puffer fish will keep taking the bait, even after you've caught him and thrown him back into the water, having learned nothing from his experience of mere minutes ago. Blue crabs are not for eating. Don't let the tip of the hook show or else the fish won't bite. In the early, early morning, when the surface of the water is black and slick in the calm before the wind comes up, it could be the wind that roughens the surface in the shallows near this bit of mangrove, or it could be a school of baby fish sheltering there. Once upon a time, you could pick oysters off the mangrove roots and eat them. Schools of seahorses once could be seen. Swimming near, swimming near Bournemouth Beach, sorry. Here's how you take up tie a weight and a hook for drop fishing. Here's how it feels when the fish takes a nibble at the bait and the energy of its impulse runs from its body up through the line that drapes over your finger. After dark, the southeast prevailing wind subsides, and then any time after 10 or so, the cooling mountain air will start to descend, and you will have your work to do sailing into that north earth if you don't have an engine. How did we know this about the wind from the north? The first boat on which my father learned to sail had no engine. His co-owner and sailing teacher, Mickey, threw it overboard one night during a week-long teaching trip because it was giving trouble and then there was never any money to get a new one. We watched what he watched, listened to him thinking out loud. He only had to tell us anything once, and there was so much we learned without his telling, because from the moment we were capable of language, we were practicing being him. With superb presumption, we simply included ourselves quietly into any conversation he had with any the shifting wind, the current, the engine, a reef. He taught us the names of the fish, we had taught us the names ourselves the names of all the markers in the deep water chipping channel because he knew them all. 
And one day, we too, no doubt, would be fully qualified to swear at a carburetor. <laughs> Where had he learned these things? A trip to the harbor was a rendezvous with the sea of his boyhood. Its memories and its lore, its life and its fantasies passed on like the rules of children's games. These were the things that came to you if you loved a place and listened to its many voices and watched it and faded it and explored it and couldn't stop going back to it because it was interesting. The mangroves, the old cemeteries, the ruined lookouts built in the 1700s and hidden among cactuses on the hilltop. The sinkholes, the shoals where the fish would bite, the places to buy bee, how that red got there, where to, buy, where to buy fried sprats. There was more of it than any knowledge, and it wrote its poetry in our bodies because it had written its poetry first in his. How did the name of that pirate stick to that little island for so long, for 200 years? The sun has beat down on these graves for centuries. A small stingray takes to the air above the yacht club lagoon and hits the water with a splash. My mother reaches out with her hand to pick a bunch of ripe sea grapes. The town of Port Royal, once the busiest port in the Caribbean and the place where the pirates spent their money, had been struck by a massive earthquake in 1692. Half of it had sunk beneath the sea. The Frenchman, Louis Galvi, was swallowed up by the earth and spit out again, swam across the harbor to safety and lived to die of old age in his bed and be buried and commemorated with a plaque in the church in Port Royal. When and how did we learn about him? I can't remember. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming tonight. Um, such a good reading. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys did too. Uh, we're done with our readings for this year, but we'll start again next year in the fall with Poets in Print readings. And, um, and we hope to see you guys all then. Uh, please enjoy some of the refreshments and uh, thank you again for coming. Thank you, John. Thank you.